Peter McKay, uh, former member of parliament for Picto Antigonish Guysboro, which later became Central Nova. I uh, spent 18 years in federal politics uh, as an elected member of the House. Uh, I was elected uh, leader of the Progressive Conservative Party in 2003. Uh, later, as a conservative, uh, the deputy leader of the Conservative Party of Canada and a member of the government from 2006 to 2015, where I served in roles um, as the Foreign Minister, uh, Minister of Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, a defense minister for six years, and minister of justice and attorney general for two. Well, leadership is a, is a daunting role, to say the least. Um, it's also a role that requires confidence, vision, uh, assuredness as to where you want to go. And you're talking about ultimately leading the country. Leading a party is one role. But the ultimate goal here, of course, is to become prime minister. So that can never be too far from your mind. But I have to go back to 97 when I was first elected. I was 31 years old. Jean Charest was then leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. He was a pivotal figure in my decision to enter public life, uh, which throughout my life to that point, I had uh, assured myself and everyone else it was not the path that I was going to take. I was quite content working as a Crown Attorney and practicing law. Jean Charest, within a year, of my being elected um, marched to a different beat and left federal politics to go back to take on Lucien Bouchard at a, at a critical time and certainly in retrospect that was the right thing for him for the country difficult decision though it was and I, and I was with him during that time and I, I have to admit felt a bit of disappointment having entered federal politics under his leadership and in large part because of his dynasticism, his leadership, and somebody who I, I really thought had uh, tremendous uh, skill set. Uh, so there we are, we have uh, a leadership contest. I truly didn't think it was my time. I was still wet behind the ears, as they say around home, and uh, still learning the ropes in Ottawa to mix metaphors. Uh, fast forward a few years, Joe Clark wins that leadership in uh, 1998. We're back in the House. We have roughly 20 seats after the corporate downsizing of the party in 93 when the Conservative Party really was in shambles. Uh, there was a, a, a basic fragmentation, the Bloc, the Reform Party. Um, and while the numbers of the Progressive Conservative Party were still competitive, the seat count, uh, it, was a, it was a devastating election to say the least. Joe Clark uh, took on the role, uh, certainly brought a tremendous amount of acumen and history within the party. As he returned to politics, uh, it didn't go as we hoped it would uh, in, uh, in many ways. In the election of 2000, we, we found ourselves uh, again uh, coming out much short of where we wanted to be. The party just barely maintained status within the House of Commons and uh, Mr. Clark made the decision to leave in, uh, in August of 2002. Uh, so the opening presented itself again within, within a relatively short time and after some considerable contemplation and consultation with, uh, with family members um, here in my constituency the network of people that you inevitably encounter over life and politics. I wasn't married at the time. Um, that was certainly a major factor in the decision uh, because of the investment and the, uh, the, the, the no small amount of stress and strain that is placed on the family in a leadership role. So I made the decision to run. It was a lengthy campaign. It was uh, 10 months before the convention in Toronto in uh, late May and June 1st of 2003. Uh, why is that context important? Because when I entered politics, the Conservative Party was at its lowest ebb in our history. Uh, in terms of both seat count, organization, the fragmentation that I described, and the reality that we had two competing Conservative parties as opposed to a unified conservative movement in Canada. 
There was a regional dynamic here as well. We were shut out in Quebec virtually, although we had come back with a few seats and people like Andre Bachon uh, and a number of others. We had a nascent growing ground game in that province. We had a strong base in Atlantic Canada. Ontario was where vote splitting was significant. That is to say, running two conservative candidates against a liberal or NDP candidate was virtually futile. We would split the vote in such a way that it, it was literally impossible for a conservative to win, although there were f a few exceptions where it happened uh, and some anomalies. And then, of course, the Reform Party was dominant in Western Canada. And it was arguably the, the base of the Progressive Conservative Party for years, including the base that had elected Joe Clark, elected Brian Mulroney, certainly elected John Diefenbaker. But there were other elements, including newer elements, remnants of social credit, Preston Manning uh, in standing up this reform party drew heavily from the Conservatives and fostered a sentiment of, I don't want to say separatism, but Western alienation and anger directed towards the centre, what Westerners would call the East, what we in the East would call Upper Canada. Uh, I, I always used to sort of cringe when I would hear people criticizing the East and I would say, well, wait a minute, you mean Ontario and Quebec. So it, it's, it's all perspective, it depends on where you sit. Conservatives only win when they're in coalition. Uh, history proves that time and time again. And let's not forget, the Conservative Party historically put the country together because of coalitions. I mean, John A. Macdonald was outward looking, visionary in the extreme, uh, although he was in politics a very long time, he, he saw uh, the country in its evolution. He, he took very risky decisions, uh, reaching out to rivals, bringing people in. The, the initial party was called the Liberal Conservative Party. Uh, people sometimes forget. Later it went through other iterations and the progressive name which was grafted onto the Conservative Party was actually a Western, agrarian-based uh, party that, that very much had antipathy and anger towards Ottawa. Sounds familiar. And so coalitions were, were not uncommon within the conservative movement, let's say, in Canada. But to come back to your question, um, my own experience in politics and my, my view is, is that you change the party from within. Yes, there could be evolutions and ebbs and flows as far as policy, uh, direction, regional tensions that exist, personalities which are unavoidably important within the, the rank and file. But like a marriage, you don't divorce yourself or, or break away uh, when these tensions arise or, or when there is a necessity to compromise and, and work it out. Just like you don't burn down your house when you want to renovate. You, you renovate within and you make the changes and that may mean taking it right down to the studs but it means working within the framework of what is the conservative movement. And, and I would suggest that throughout the history and evolution of the Conservative Party, um, all of these tensions and, and natural differences that do exist because of perspectives and because of upbringing and outlook, uh, there was always very much a, a cornerstone, a foundation upon which conservatives operated. Smaller government, lower taxes, strong support for our military, more of a law and order party, almost a natural mistrust of big government. And whether you were from Outport, Newfoundland and Labrador, or northern BC, Calgary, Toronto, you know, urban, rural. There was a natural bond that existed, I believe, within conservatives. And I, I came to politics at a time, as I said earlier, where we were at our, our lowest ebb as far as support, more fragmented than we'd ever been in our history. But pretty quickly after arriving in Ottawa, I saw in people like Monty Solberg and Chuck Strahl and certain members. Ian McClellan was a, a very important person when I got to Ottawa. He was deputy speaker, but he immediately reached out to me and 
I started to quickly understand that we had far more in common as progressive conservatives with reform than the animosity and antipathy that had existed in previous years. And, and the fights in the family are the worst. They're the most intense. And there was this sense that the Reform Party wanted to replace the progressive conservatives, wipe them out. The progressive conservatives, on the other hand, felt somehow entitled and emboldened by the fact that they were the, the John A. Macdonald party and this upstart reform could never replace them. And so there was, there was tremendous baggage and history that I didn't necessarily carry, even though my father had been you know, a prominent member of Brian Mulroney's government, had been a minister in Joe Clark's government, had fought the, you know, the wars previously under the Trudeau administration, uh, Trudeau Sr. And so uh, some of that history actually was attached to me, you know, and it wasn't exactly correct. It didn't fit. Uh, but the essence of politics in Canada, anywhere, the essence is you put your country first. And it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't even matter what party or political philosophy you carry. It really is about nation building. That's what was so important about the men and women that brought this country together, that made it whole. And it, and it like parties, evolved and went through different iterations. And uh, obviously, the tensions then, some still exist. But representative democracy demands compromise. Representative democracy within a party, similarly, requires that people are going to bring forward these ideas. It's sometimes a very bruising, messy affair, which leads to a discussion about conventions and leadership changes. But policy conventions, similarly, can be nasty affairs. And yet, you keep it in-house. You, you do so in a way that respects and accepts, in some cases, differences of opinion that lead to consensus, that lead to a sense of, we can live with this. And we respect that the majority feel this way. And we'll revisit this if need be. But when you storm out of the room, rather than fight it out, and you know there may be blood coming out under the door, but you, you get it done. And then you move on to the important contest, which is a general election. And that, to me, um, has always been essential in order for a party to be effective. And when you're divided, as the old saying goes, a, a house divided against itself uh, cannot stand. And the Conservative Party throughout our history is rife with moments in time where divisions overcame the ability to, be, to present themselves as an effective alternative. And the last thing I'll say on that point is our system, which evolved from Great Britain, is predicated on the necessity of a very strong effective opposition to present that alternative. Democracy demands a, a testing of the government, a pressing on so many important issues. And the Conservative Party throughout its history, both in government and importantly in opposition, is most effective when you're able to find that honorable compromise and make it work. So bringing your party to the people and ultimately to the House of Commons necessitates uh, a rigorous process of self-examination, but there has to be cohesiveness. Parties have to be cohesive and obviously coherent in their presentation and communicate those ideas effectively. And I would suggest we're at a point in, in history where the communications part has taken on an even more critically important element in getting those ideas across to the people. But that alternative, that democratic choice, has to be there. And when parties splinter, when opposition falters, the government has a free reign. And that's not good for democracy. And it's ultimately uh, destabilizing for a country. And a country starts to drift. And, and people pull back then when they see the government isn't acting in their interest, but there's nobody there to stand up to the government and to hold them to account. And the media, of course, play an important role in that accountability too. After the decision of, of Joe Clark to step down, after what had to have been a, a disappointing result uh, in the extreme of his return to politics and an attempt to regain the Prime Minister's chair. Uh, there were a few of us in the caucus 
who made the decision to run, Andre Bachon from Quebec, Scott Bryson also from Nova Scotia. Uh, we had a person in Jim Prentice, the late Jim Prentice from Calgary, uh, who had a long history in the party but not in elected office. He presented uh, for leadership. Uh, David Orchard, who was seen by many, I think correctly, as an outsider within the Conservative Party, had been previously more attached to the Liberal Party and, and protested uh, the Conservative Party over the Free Trade Agreement. Um, Craig Chandler uh, was also um, someone who I didn't have any previous knowledge of, but from Western Canada. And it was a long, protracted leadership campaign, 10 months, lots of debates, lots of touring. We were on a shoestring budget, all the candidates were. And we were grappling with an effort to revitalize the party, to get public attention even, which is part of the lifeblood of politics, and to present a new vision. And so, by design, leadership contests tend to be a clash of ideas internally, but it's also a great chance to road test policies for a future election. It's also very much predicated on engaging the public and having that type of interaction. It's also importantly about keeping the country whole and going to every corner of Canada. At that time, 308 constituencies and showcasing what you, but importantly also the party, have to offer in contrast to the government of the day. Even during a leadership convention? Even during a leadership convention. It's, again, to me, the brand of the party is, is always on your shoulders. You're wearing a team jersey. I make too many sports analogies, but it, it, politics is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. You have to have a strong team around you. And I think sometimes in, in current political scenarios everywhere, it becomes too personality and too leadership driven. The, the, the art of compromise is the art of possible in politics. And you, you can never think that you're more important than the party, let alone more important than the country, to succeed in my view. So to come back to the, the leadership contest, it culminates with the convention. These conventions can be a lot of fun and can be quite invigorating for the membership, uh, for the party, but also, again, it's, it's part of the showcasing of, of the various players within the party, the personalities, the policy, which is sort of the wonky part of politics, but it's very important. I mean, policies decide how budgets are made up. Policies decide how prevalent the environmental issues are going to be. How do we address First Nations issues? What about our military and foreign policy involvement uh, outside of Canada's borders? How do we ensure equality and justice within our system? These are all wide open discussions that happen and, and really quite stimulating for, for Canadians who actively participate in our political process. And democratically, it's decided where the party will go. And where the party and the leader goes is where the country goes in most cases, should you be so fortunate to become elected and form a government. And so all of these nascent, sometimes convoluted processes that many Canadians who are not active and, and don't hold party memberships, which is the majority of Canadians, uh, and really who tune in perhaps only around election time and the seven seconds that they might get on the nightly news or browsing through their, their email accounts. All that heavy lifting and hard work is done by party activists and people who really dial in. And, and this is also evolving. I think while there's a, a recognition of the importance of politics, there's a waning level of participation, and I don't mean only in, in elections themselves in terms of declining voter turnout, but also getting young people to actively engage in the political process is critically important. But many, I find, are drifting more towards NGOs or pursuing other means to express themselves, which is all okay. But I'm of the view that the party system and the political process in the evolution of our country is so important and necessitates involvement. It necessitates participation of people from all walks of life, 
uh, of all backgrounds, of, of, of all uh, obvious outlooks to get the broadest possible consensus. You need broad bandwidth for a party to really represent the country because this is a big, diverse, unnatural country in some ways. Unnatural in the sense that, you know, our affiliations in some ways historically were more north-south than east-west. Well, it's very problematic when people disengage or worse, feel so cynical and so disaffected that they deliberately opt out. Uh, that, that starts to crumble some of these foundations and institutions that make up the country. And it also undermines democracy, in my view. You know, many people will say, and it's kind of a harsh expression, that if you don't vote, you know, don't complain. But there's some truth in that. Uh, if you don't at least cast a ballot, it, it does undermine some of your ability to say, you know, I don't like the government or things should change. The leadership process is decided by the party membership. Uh, within the conservative movement, we have tried different iterations of leadership contests. Uh, the one I participated in in 2002, 2003 came about um, as part of the the process that mirrors our, our electoral process, that is to say there was equal representation from every riding in the country. And this was informative, instructive for me as to why you had equal weighting of every riding. So my constituency, which has a population of roughly 85,000 compared to well over 150,000 in a Toronto or Calgary or Montreal riding, gets an equal voice in the House of Commons, one person representing that constituency. In a leadership contest of the variety that we used, it was the same. You had delegates coming from every constituency in the country. And why is that important? Because it then necessitates that the leader court those constituencies equally and spends time investing themselves in representing that riding. If it's all a one member, one vote, mass landslide, you can go to just where the population is and, and arguably win and exclude huge swaths of the rural part of Canada, which is in fact the majority of Canada, but where people le live and where the culture is strong and where their, their opinions matter and where their views are sometimes not heard in Ottawa. And so I'm a big believer in having a process that demands, necessitates, that leaders go out there and meet the people in every constituency, in every corner. And I, and I fought very hard for that years later to keep that prevalent in our policy selection and our leadership selection. It was, in fact, the make or break point when we got to the, the moment of reuniting the conservative movement in Canada, uh, Mr. Harper and myself. Conventions can be very exciting and a bit like sporting events, and people pay to go. They, they sign up and they go to their local riding association contest to be a delegate. And there's a, so there's a, a very much overused expression, but grassroots process that assigns them the, the delegate status that allows them to go to the convention. And this again is a, is a commitment. You're, you're investing in your party and you're investing your time and your effort and your resources away from other pursuits to be part of the process and, and you have a leader and you have maybe certain policies or positions that you want advanced and, and it moves to this convention floor. And it does have this air of excitement because no one's sure who's gonna win. No, no one knows what that outcome will be. And in a delegated convention, just like a, a contest, there are changes that occur. There are circumstances that perhaps weren't foreseen or or predicted there's all kinds of intrigue that can happen at a convention. And I, I mean, some of those things you would have preferred didn't happen, but there you go. From a, a candidate's perspective, when you're presenting yourself for leadership, uh, you go there to win. Make no mistake about it. You've just campaigned for 10 months. You go there hoping to win on the first ballot even. You hope to have done the groundwork, the heavy lifting, to get enough delegates in the hall convinced that you're the person who will represent them.
Well, after 10 months of virtually scouring the country uh, for support and seeing a lot of motels and driving in the back uh, of a lot of old cars and, and getting very familiar, immersed in, in the country, uh, you show up in Toronto and you hope that the people who have committed to you will be there. And the majority of them do show up. Um, but like, uh, like everything in life, uh, there's all kinds of circumstances at play. Events, my dear boy, events, Churchill once said. Um, and as, as the day unfolded and into the following day of the convention weekend in Toronto, it became more and more apparent that we weren't likely to win on the first ballot. And, and that happens more often than not that you don't get 50% plus one, especially in a contest with multiple candidates. Um, and there was, there was all sorts of dynamics. Certain candidates had the support of prior leaders. Certain candidates had regional perspectives. Uh, everyone also has that calculus that's intangible, and that is who's able to come out of this convention and take on Paul Martin, who was then a, a juggernaut he was going to win the most seats ever in Canadian political history. He was the finance minister for years, had the experience, had the acu all, all of it was very daunting. And so that was in the back of people's minds. Who's going to be able to take this party forward? There was also this huge elephant in the room around, we, we're still split, we're still a divided conservative movement. Are we going to try to reconcile this or are we going to go it alone? And while that didn't receive a lot of attention that weekend, there were other big considerations, that was still looming large for the Conservative Party. And, you know, having, having kind of experienced that dynamic in Parliament for a long time and the frustration of having been through numerous elections now, to come back to opposition to see that we were hand-delivering victory to the Liberal Party time and time again since 93 that was clearly part of the the entire dynamic within within the hall but I come back to the fact that I went there to win I, I didn't go there to to forfeit uh, what I felt was a, an important contribution that I wanted to make to public life I wanted to lead the party I, I had clear ideas uh, that I wanted to bring to politics, changes that I thought were important, most notably to the justice system that I had been working in for years, to the, the, the spending that was going on, uh, the neglect of our military, a whole panoply of ideas that I thought needed to be addressed by the government. So that's the cut and thrust of the, the leadership contest and the debate, and you're, you're on full display. The scrutiny is is incredible and uh, the criticism is daunting to say the least and uh, it, it is a very personal presentation that you make of yourself and your ideas uh, and, and again it's it's important that, you know the, the people and the ideas within the party are like molecules they're all bouncing off one another it's a, it's a very very important forum for political debate and, and uh, ideas and ideologies so as we approached the final ballot, uh, it came down to, because of decisions that other candidates had made to support other people, uh, we had hoped that we might be able to pick up the support of, of certain candidates or at least some of their supporters if the candidate themselves wasn't going to endorse our camp. Uh, but it didn't play out. Um, as the great Robbie Burns would say, the best made plans of mice and men often go aglay. And this brought us to a bit of a showdown at the end where it was either going to be Jim Prentice or myself reaching out to David Orchard, who had brought a significant number of delegates. I mean, he was second throughout the voting. And while he had no room for growth, uh, he was ultimately cast in the role of kingmaker by the decisions of other candidates. 
uh, I would have thought that a fellow Nova Scotian would come to another Nova Scotian. Um, and we had shared perspective on, on many, many issues, but it didn't pan out that way for, for reasons I still don't fully understand. Um, now, some of those candidates ultimately wound up in the Liberal Party. So that will be, that will be for history <laughs> to judge as to their true commitment. Uh, some of them were even negotiating to leave the party while still in the leadership contest, which again is, is a bit hard to fathom and uh, certainly disingenuous, Machiavellian, some would say. Um, certain candidates in the final analysis, you almost wonder if they were doing this in a, in a deliberate way to sabotage our process. I think that's a bit of a conspiracy myself. Nevertheless, I wound up in a negotiation with David Orchard. David Orchard was similarly negotiating with Jim Prentice, who was now backed by Scott Bryson. How do I know that? While I was speaking to David Orchard, his phone rang. And it was Scott Bryson calling on behalf of Jim Prentice, offering him a deal. That deal was identical to the discussion that we were having. What made this particularly intriguing is we wrote it all down. We put it down in writing. Uh, what Mr. Orchard wanted, uh, which was reasonable in the circumstance, was certain input and control over decisions within the party, both in policy and in headquarters. He wanted a review of the free trade agreement, which he adamantly opposed. The agreement was over 10 years old at that point, and certainly a review was a reasonable request, uh, given his position. We're in the process now of renegotiation, fast forward, you know, 20 years. And he had strong views on, on environment and reforestation and sustainable water. And all of this, to me, was, was very reasonable. The more controversial element, as it turned out, of course, was no merger, no talks, no single party. Um, and looking back on that, uh, that was the position of the Progressive Conservative Party as stated by the members. We had a 301 rule. I said 308 earlier. It's, it was 301. And what that meant is we had to run a Progressive Conservative candidate in every single riding. So that necessitated no merger. I knew we couldn't, we, ha we could agree to that because we would have to go back to the membership in any event, which we ultimately did, and, and we'll, we'll come to that. And so this looked like a, a reasonable proposal to me that I could certainly agree to. Our big mistake in retrospect was because of the pace of the convention and because of the, the way that things unfolded, and we should have anticipated perhaps that we would find ourselves in this position. Um, communicating all of this was very difficult, particularly in the time crunch that we were in. And, and the electric atmosphere that existed. And nobody throughout the, the entire process had, you, you know, the traditional conservative base, the supporters that, that we were reaching out to, very few of them were comfortable with David Orchard, the people that, that were at the convention. He had almost a cult-like following. And to a person, they were there because of David Orchard, not because of the Progressive Conservative Party. And there was a look and feel in his camp that was completely different than everybody else in the room. Others were distinguishable by the t-shirts and buttons they were wearing, but David Orchard's people were David Orchard's people. And so many commentators and, and even some of the other candidates had cast him in a very negative light. I had actually while I differed with them strenuously on policy, I said, well, this is a democratic process. People have a right to run and present their ideas. And the inclusiveness of the Conservative Party, to me, was and is very important. Uh, if people want to bring their ideas forward and the membership embrace it, that's fine. If they reject it, you have to accept that as well. And so, with that in mind, signing this agreement, I knew that it would have to ultimately be vetted and approved by the party membership. So when we signed this agreement, we went back to the hall. The next ballot uh, had already been cast. 
The results were released. I was still short of the 50% plus one necessitated to, to win. He had 25% from start to finish. That 25% came to me, so I, I won the convention with over 65% of the delegate support, which is a pretty strong majority in a convention with that many candidates. But it was seen by many and cast by the media and the pundits as a poison pill. That, well, even though David Orchard had 25% of the delegates and had campaigned like everybody else, and we had differed but had, uh, you know, a cordial relationship throughout the campaign, this was described as the deal with the devil. It was Faustian. It was epic, the betrayal of the membership by me to have locked arms and won the leadership. And I don't want to sound defensive about this, but every leadership in every party in the history of Canada happened because of a deal. And, and look, the deal was released. It was written down. That's what made it completely unusual. It, it was transparent. It was presented to the, to the members and later voted upon by the members. And so I, I to this day, still struggle with the vehement attacks that followed. The, the personal vindictive uh, descriptions that were cast upon me that this was all about my personal ambitions and I sold my soul and I destroyed the progressive conservative party. Well, life goes on. You, you know, you pack up your your, uh, your kit bag and you, you go back to work, uh, which is what we did. And we attempted to honor those commitments. We made changes within the party structure of certain people in the head office. Uh, we put together a blue ribbon panel to examine free trade, uh, its virtues and its shortcomings. We went about ensuring that future policy would include some of these important elements uh, that Mr. Orchard had insisted upon, uh, all of which the, the membership were discussing anyway. Natural resources, yes. Uh, bringing, you know, rail to the country, sure. So, you know, there were, there were ideas there that were not foreign by any stretch. So the agreement itself was, was written down. And at the time, I had struck the word no talks because I knew there had to be talks. I mean, we had to cooperate at a parliamentary level, but the talks were happening. They were happening across the country in riding associations. P people were trying to find a way to end vote splitting. People wanted to do runoff nominations. There was talk of a non-aggression pact where we wouldn't run a candidate in certain parts of the country or certain constituencies. So talk was, was happening everywhere, and it was organic, and there was no way to stop people from talking within the conservative movement, why would you? So I took that out, knowing full well that, uh, you know, talks were going to continue. The no merger part was easy because, as I said, there was, there was a, already a policy position taken very strenuously that we would not merge. And, and you'd have to go to the membership in any event. It wasn't a decision that a leader could take. And we, we went about honoring that agreement. And we went about building the party. We went about... You know, it wasn't like you could just go and now sit in a, in a room or go back to Parliament and let things unfold. There was a lot more work to do. Now that I had become leader, it was hit the road again, Jack, and there was a lot of um, heavy lifting. I still had a constituency to represent. I had decisions now to make about uh, healing the wounds of a, of a very bruising uh, leadership campaign trying to include people from other camps. Uh, I made uh, Scott Bryson the uh, finance critic, which he wanted. I put him in charge of policy. He had certain other um, interests that he wanted to pursue. I even went so far as to take his phone number, which David, writ David Orchard had written in the margins of the agreement because we were on the phone. He was on the phone with Bryson while we were in this discussion. He wrote it down. I removed that to shield Bryson from controversy and criticism, 
I mean, I was later savaged as the only one that would have signed an agreement with David Orchard. And I just took it rather than said, well, hold on a minute. These other guys were similarly prepared to sign anything and more. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Most of these agreements involve promises of cabinet positions in government, paying off leadership debt, all kinds of other, let's say, less than principled promises. Ours was completely transparent, there for all the world to see, and it was done in a way that I thought would ultimately involve party approval. Uh, and I went immediately after the leadership to meet with caucus, so the, the, the members of parliament, progressive conservative members, the Senate, later consulted in the, in the process of, of bringing the parties together with the executive of the party, so the party president, the people who were elected by the party at a non-parliamentary level. We then went to every single card-carrying member of the progressive conservative party and, and even left it open for a period for people who wanted to sign up to participate. It was a national referendum on whether the party should reunify as a movement. There was, to that point, short of the, the Quebec referendum, nothing that was comparable. But it was obviously all within the conservative movement uh, and sort of flew under the, the radar. Very simple question about whether we should reemerge as one political ident entity to present itself to the country as an opposition to the Liberal government. We released it to the media, but we waited 48 hours because I wanted the opportunity to go to the elected members and the caucus first. I felt I owed them that. Plus, we made the deliberate decision to remove the, the phone number to avoid further controversy and, and shield another leadership candidate from the criticism that I was receiving. Uh, in, in retrospect, that, that was probably too magnanimous, but in any event, I... I was a little taken aback, to say the least, at the, the, the incredible backlash from some members of the party, but the media presented this as the, the most sinister and, and underhanded uh, move that had ever occurred in recent political history. And nothing could be further from the truth. It was all done in the open. It was all democratically approved in the final analysis. Uh, and yet, did that influence future decisions that I had to make about continuing leadership ambitions? Absolutely. I, I, I mean, politically, I was severely wounded coming out of that convention in such a way that, you know, ultimately um, my ability to, to lead the party was, was diminished. Uh, and, you know, I learned uh, the hard way, the power of the media and the importance of communication and the necessity to react very quickly. Just like in a sporting event, that it ebbs and flows. There are turns of events, there are fumbles, you turn over the puck, uh, there, there's pivotal events that occur and your ability to cast them in a favorable as opposed to a negative light uh, can have enormous impact down the road. I mean, in military terms, I, I think of that old uh, poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, and I'm paraphrasing it, you know, but for loss of a, a shoe, a horse was lost. For loss of a horse, a soldier was lost. A battle was lost. A war was lost. A country was lost. So these cascading events, uh, which were occurring in real time at a very rapid pace, it, it cast the outcome of that convention and it, and it cast my leadership in a very negative light. And uh, that was difficult. That, that was something that uh, really, you know, had long-term implications in, in so many, it didn't just affect me, it affected a lot of people and it arguably affected future events for the conservative movement. Stephen Harper, by this point in time, had become the leader of the Alliance Party uh, and he had a long history with the Reform Party and with the Progressive Conservative Party prior to that. He'd worked in Ottawa under the Brian Mulroney uh, government. Uh, and while the party had taken a very staunch position in previous policy conventions and previous 
party gatherings, no trucker trade with alliance was the, the phrase. I think John Crosby may have coined that phrase. And, uh, and that was my view, and it was the view of, of many leading up to and, and going into the convention. Even though we had made, we, uh, members of both the Alliance, previously Reform, and Progressive Conservative Party, had various interactions in the House. We cooperated at committee levels, in, in debates, and as I said earlier, there was a, a recognition on the part of many that there was a lot more that we had in common. And th this practice of attacking each other, I mean, the Liberals would light up in, in glee. Uh, and there was also this looming election, which had a lot to do with the accelerated pace at which certain decisions and actions had to be taken. So to answer your question, I ran into Stephen Harper in the lobby of the House of Commons, and I simply said, sort of as an offhand comment, we should talk sometime. And there had been a lot of back and forth, and some of it in the media, and some of it very unhelpful on, on both sides. Um, and so that, again, made some of the dynamics awkward and hard to overcome at first. But the bigger picture was a growing number of conservatives uh, and interested Canadians, particularly many in the business community, because democracy was broken. It was dysfunctional at that time. The Liberals were going to win no matter what. That's not a competitive democracy. I'm a big believer in competition, and that's what tests you in the arena, like the old gladiators. I mean, it's getting in there and on full display, putting it all out there. And, and giving people choice. Democracy, it, it has to have choice and, and a reasonable choice to boot. And so with some of that and, and what I had been through at the convention and uh, all of the, the backlash, and, you know, there was a, I guess, I'm a bit of a contrarian at times and when it occurred to me pretty quickly that people did not want the conservative movement to get back together. If you're a liberal, or a social democrat, or somebody who doesn't like the conservative movement, you, you don't want to see them get their act together. You, you don't want to see a strong conservative movement. If you're sitting there as the pri liberal prime minister, as Paul Martin was, the last thing you want to do is run against a unified conservative party, particularly after you've been there more than 10 years, because there's a natural cycle. And because of vote splitting, we were missing the natural cycle. The cycle had now been broken. The formula was, was no longer there. That, you know, the Liberal Party governs, certain things happen, the country can turn to the Conservative Party. That was no longer possible with two Conservative parties being presented and vote splitting. So we had to go about fixing that. I, I had been a believer of that for some time, although nobody thought it could happen before the next election. Keep in mind, a lot of this is, is now in the fall of 2003. The election is in the spring of 2004. To try to, you know, unscramble that egg in less than six months, pretty uphill battle the whole way with people pouring hot oil on you the whole time. It was challenging, to say the least. And so the talks were very nascent in the beginning, although there was lines of communication that had been opened for some years, including the difficulties that the Alliance Party went through. Preston Manning has now been ousted. Stockwell Day is the leader. They're having a leadership crisis, which results ultimately in Stephen Harper becoming leader of the Alliance. They had members who had defected, had left, and had come and sat with us in coalition. It was the Progressive Conservative Reform Democratic Alliance, the PRDC, I think was the, the, the acronym. In any event, we had come to the conclusion that it probably wasn't going to happen, but we owed it to the country, and we owed it to our membership to at least try. And so, talks. Talks began. Talks were, were more formalized now. The, the informal talks had been going on for some time. And Stephen Harper, through emissaries and outreach, and, and myself through the same, 
decided in, in relatively short order after the leadership. I was a new leader. He was a new leader. We didn't have all of the same predilections that perhaps the previous leaders had. And the history between Mr. Manning and Mr. Clark was also a factor, uh, I think, that kept the two parties in separate corners. It started very organically, and we ultimately uh, decided upon a process of having emissaries on our behalf. In my case, I was blessed. I mean, I was so fortunate of all the esteemed members to get involved in this process. Don Mazankowski, an iconic progressive conservative, former deputy pr uh, prime minister uh, from Western Canada. Bill Davis, uh, former premier of Ontario, head of the big blue machine, uh, someone who knew a lot about compromise and having run minority governments and having worked in many channels to, to reach out to people and someone who was a very close friend and confidant throughout my leadership and my time in, in Ottawa was Lyola Hearn who also had provincial political experience but was just a just a tremendous man a, a prince of a man really gracious full of common sense uh, very loquacious outgoing and so with that team and people on the other side that Stephen Harper had appointed, uh, they sat down with this very daunting, onerous task of trying to maybe weave together some agreement. As I said before, there was talk of non-aggression pact. We don't run in certain ridings. They don't run in certain ridings. Nobody really liked that because, again, you were taking away choice as opposed to presenting a unified front. And word came back from these early discussions quite quickly that we might be on to something. This, this could actually work. Uh, and it might happen much quicker than anybody anticipated. And lo and behold, when we started going through this consultation process, and there were hiccups, and some people were leaking the discussions, which was very unhelpful and, and almost cratered the whole effort. But nevertheless, what it finally came down to, and it, and it wasn't even the name which people thought would be controversial, uh, because everyone agreed, we're conservatives. This is a conservative movement that we're talking about. Uh, and the progressive, as the history will show, the progressive part didn't have the Oxford Dictionary meaning of progressive when it first attached to the conservative party. It, it was like the Western Reform Party. It was the big P progressive that had resulted in a coalition, I believe, in the 1940s when John Bracken was leading the progressives and then briefly led the, the progressive conservatives. And so those previous coalitions were also helpful, uh, instructive. And what it came down to in the end was this controversial issue of how you choose policy and how you choose leaders. And the reform tradition, alliance, tradition had been one member one vote so full-blown you know some would call it pure representative democracy our history was predicated more on the electrical electoral system I should say the electoral system that necessitated support in every region of the country and having a delegated convention and it prevented any region or any sort of urban dominance over rural interests, uh, it meant ensuring inclusivity and, and ensuring that, you know, and I guess my own regional background being Atlantic Canada, I was concerned about the party being swamped by either regional interests or an interest of big cities. I represent a very rural riding and, and so my experience told me that we need to ensure that there's a voice there uh, for some of the smaller regions that are important finding ways to ensure that even the smallest parts of the population, the tiny little communities that are on the fringes, that they're included as well. And that, that doesn't just mean regionally, it, it means ethnically. It means people who sometimes are outside the center of power. It, it was important for the Conservative Party to have inclusivity baked into its very formula. And that, again, without sounding grandiose, goes back to that grand coalition of Sir John A. Macdonald. 
that put the whole thing together, that uh, you know, reached out across French-English divides, Catholic, Protestant, East, West, Upper, Lower Canada, you know, the looming threat of American invasion. There was all of these different dynamics and, and the political battles that he had been through. Uh, those big picture ideas are extremely important, undeniably important when you're trying to make our political system work. And it, it's why I do believe that the party system with all its, its warts and failings and shortcomings, it does work. Uh, it does work if you get people to come together and hammer out these different ideas, put aside personal bias, find a way, and then go forward and compete. But you can't compete in a boxing match or in any fight with one or both hands tied behind your back. You have to compete on even footing and that means having a vibrant political party that has sorted those things out before going into battle. I'm sorry to use all these uh, euphemistic military uh, analogies but it really is. It, it is a clash of ideas and it's a uh, you know and it's predicated on money and advertising and all of those other things but it, it starts and ends with the unity of the party. And the unity of the party had been shaken to the core by the divisions that happened in the 1993 election. And that's what I and, and others who came on the scene after had inherited. And so there was a whole lot of history and a whole lot of animus that had to be overcome. And that was never far from my thoughts as we tried to undertake this effort to rebuild the Conservative Party in Canada and make it a competitive party to present to the people in the election of 2004. This wasn't about me at that point, uh, certainly not. Uh, the importance of a competitive democracy, the importance of party unity and um, the vibrant Conservative movement that I knew could and should exist in Canada it's far bigger than any one individual. And I fairly quickly came to the conclusion that, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of baggage uh, and had accumulated it in a, in a very short time that would have hurt the party in many ways. And plus, I was coming from that legacy party, although only having led for a short time. Stephen Harper arguably had that as well, but not, didn't have the, the whole leadership contest uh, copy blotted as, as I had, but he had come through also a pretty rigorous process. And it, it, it was about the bigger picture. It was about now ensuring that we were ready. Plus there was this time crunch of a looming election, a juggernaut in Paul Martin. The Gombrey inquiry would never have happened without the unification of the Conservative Party. And without being overly partisan, there was a corruption and a rot inside the Liberal government of the day that would have never been exposed to the extent that it was. And that was also important. There was also a justice component to this that I felt had bigger implications. And so I made the decision not to run for the leadership of the new Conservative Party. Uh, there were other contestants, and ultimately we know history uh, Stephen Harper won that contest. He brought me in as the deputy leader of the, the new conservative movement and the rest is history. We won an election, uh, though we came close in 2004, 2006, we formed government from the, 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 the shambles, the, the wreckage of the conservative party just a few years earlier, we coalesced, which again justified the decision in my view it, I hope, rehabilitated me. I was re-elected in my own constituency, you know, several times after. And, and much of that faded a little bit. But I need for, for people to understand that this betrayal, as it was portrayed, of David Orchard was the decision of the party in the most democratic 
inclusive way that I could possibly present it. Consultation with the elected members, the Senate, the executive, the presidents of every riding association, and then ultimately going back to every single card-carrying member of the party who had their say, should we proceed with this unification of conservatives? The answer was a resounding yes. 90%, 90% endorsed the idea of merging. Wasn't my decision thrust upon the people? Wasn't meant to go against the agreement of the leadership? David Orchard ultimately went and ran for the Liberal Party. He protested vociferously, as was his right. Uh, but we tried to honor the agreement, but we also had to respect the will of the people and the will of the party membership and, and in fact, the bigger, better interests of the country being served, which is what I think history will show. And so there wasn't this deliberate, nefarious plot going on this naked ambition to win the leadership and win the country by all means. It was about building the foundation and, and the blocks necessary to have a competitive democracy. And if people say, what do you want written on your political tombstone? I would say I'd put the country first. Well, I think the role of the media is, is an absolutely essential role in informing people, uh, an informed electorate, uh, citizens need to know what they're supporting and not supporting and the media are the the purveyors of information now are they the purveyors of truth is an important consideration and therein lies that accountability mechanism that is very prevalent in politics and elected office you have to go back to the people you have to reapply for your job you're, you're constantly under the, the, the microscope and, you know, how that is portrayed is, is sometimes what I struggle with in terms of modern media. And I think the media are under a lot of pressure, like many professions. Things have evolved very quickly. The, the advent of social media has undeniably changed the way journalism operates and has caused huge pressure. Now, I'm from a coal mining town. I know that pressure is what turns coal into diamonds. So it, it can work in a positive way or it can crush you. And I think competition is also an important part of the media. They're competing now with social media, which is instantaneous reporting with very little fact and often a lot of editorial opinion. And so that has caused a bit of a distortion in how things are reported, how they're presented to the public. And so that has cast a bit of a negative light, I think, on media in a way that perhaps didn't exist when there was fact-checking and the paper that was released on Monday morning had a tremendous amount of oversight and you couldn't put anything in writing because you could be sued and there was privacy concerns and interest around ensuring the accuracy. That seems to have been blown out of the water to a large degree and so there, there's a dangerous atmosphere out there uh, and huge public mistrust, huge cynicism, not only about politics, which the media have sometimes fostered, but now about the media itself and the so-called fake news and the way in which now the media are under a lot more scrutiny than they used to be. and so there's still an adjustment happening and I, I think the, the evolution will hopefully result in a, a more ethical presentation of, of news. Uh, and so again, that, that accountability I hope will kick in and improve what I still maintain is a, an absolutely essential part of democracy. The media, uh, the way things are reported, the, the way in which the public need that independent voice, that arbitrator in some ways of what's really happening and how the public interest is, is being uh, protected. Um, there's no question that we need a strong, vibrant, truthful media.